move aside, sir. Order your man to step aside or there will be violence. In Game of Thrones, antagonists come and go, yet one has been a constant since the very first episode. That character is none other than Cersei F. Lannister. And the F is for fuck it. I'll blow up an entire sept and kill everyone that has wronged me, if that's what it takes. Whether you love to hate her, or hate to love her, or even if you're just straight up rooting for her at this point, there is no denying that she is one of the best characters the show has to offer. Sure, she is flawed and has had her mishaps as the show progressed, but her ability to persevere and end up where she believes she has always belonged has been one of the more entertaining character arcs of the entire show. First you hate her, then you really fucking hate her, then you sympathize with her, and if you're like me, actively root for her in some situations. She isn't as one note as a Joffrey or a Ramsay, but rather complex, with motivations you can kind of understand and relate to, such as trying to protect her family, the love she has for her children, and of course looking out for her own best interests, because let's face it, no one loves Cersei more than Cersei, not even me. And we see these motivations play out time and time again, whether it's in season one where she takes out Ned and Robert in one season. Just think about that for a second. Two of the most iconic figures in Westeros are taking out within a few episodes because of who? You guessed it. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is no middle ground. And in season two, her back and forth with Tyrion make for some of the best scenes in the entire series. Do you know why Varys is so dangerous? Because he has thousands of spies in his employ. Because he knows everything we do before we do it. Because he doesn't have a cock. Neither do you. And of course, there's her battle with the Tyrells, where, well, I think we all know how that ended up. Cue the fucking explosion. And the clear standout for me is when she's pitted against the High Sparrow. We see Cersei at her absolute lowest point. Two of her children are gone, and she feels the last one slipping away, which causes her to make a tremendous mistake and trust in the High Sparrow to get rid of Marjorie. And seeing her come back even stronger and in a more powerful position sums up her character perfectly. Because unlike Joffrey, Tywin, Ramsay, and whoever else you've hated throughout the years, Cersei is still here and she's ready. For what? I don't know. Probably should know, because I'm doing a Cersei video, but I'll do my best. Where does Cersei's arc go in Season 8? When we last see her in Season 7, she has gone back on her word with Tyrion and has driven Jaime away, leaving her all alone with only the Mountain and Kyburn to keep her company. Imagine those two being her only friends. Right now, it seems Cersei's content with destruction taking place up north while she takes her remaining forces, plus the newly acquired Golden Company, and reinforces her control over the rest of Westeros. It's actually pretty funny and very reminiscent of what Varys said about Littlefinger, that he would let the whole country burn if he could be the King of Ashes. Because right now, it doesn't seem she cares too much about the Great War up north. The way she sees it, if Danny and Jon are able to defeat the Night King, then their army will be most likely decimated, to the point where she could easily defeat them and secure herself on the Iron Throne. Or if the Night King wins, then, well, screw it, we're all fucked anyway. Many fans have theorized that Cersei will somehow become the Night Queen, and I don't know if I buy into that theory too much. Although one aspect of a theory I read that I find intriguing is the possibility of the Night King flying his newly acquired dragon down south to create another army of the dead to flank Jon and Daenerys. Imagine if the newly acquired Golden Company all turned into whites. Let's just hope she didn't waste all her wildfire. Again, cue the... <laughs> and it's interesting, speaking of the Golden Company, what role they will play in Season 8. Obviously, in the books, they have allegiances to the Blackfires. I don't know if they would translate that into Targaryens for the sake of the show. I mean, we've talked about this before and other people in the Game of Thrones fandom that they expect the Golden Company to maybe turn on Cersei and join with Daenerys or Jon. If Jon and Danny succeed at Winterfell and turn their attention south, it would seem that they would be greatly outnumbered by Cersei. Not only will their numbers be decimated by the Battle of Winter, but morale would surely be low after such a devastating showdown. And who knows if Drogon or Rhaegal make it out alive. Even if they do, we have seen Danny's hesitance to burn down an entire city with Tyrion's council before. The deciding factor could be the Golden Company, and if they honor their contract with Cersei or switch over to Jon and Daenerys. 
In the novels, the Golden Company have strong ties with House Blackfire, a branch of House Targaryen. Since there has been no mention of House Blackfire in the show to this point, D&D may decide to switch their historical alliance to that of House Targaryen. This would all but secure Jon or Daenerys' victory if these two forces were to meet in Season 8. And this could also be a catalyst for Cersei's demise as she realizes that she has no other option she decides to maybe burn down the city, which yet again relates to Jaime repeating history and having to take her out yet again to save King's Landing. And of course, in the trailer, there's that shot of Cersei drinking wine, seemingly a little teary-eyed. So maybe this is what happens and takes place, and the Golden Company leaves her, and she has this moment of reflection where she's all alone again, and her newly acquired power, the fate of her child, is in question. But when it comes to her fate in Season 8, many have speculated on how Cersei will meet her demise. Because at this point, most people feel like she's not going to make it out of Season 8. Many people have looked to the novels and instances from the show to predict this what seems to be inevitable outcome, yet it's hard to say for sure what route D&D will go. When looking to theorize where Cersei's story will end up, book readers and show watchers alike point to the prophecy bestowed on her by Maggie the Frog. In the season 5 premiere, Maggie tells Cersei that she will never marry a prince, but marry a king, referring to Rhaegar and Robert respectively. Also that she will be queen for a time until a younger, more beautiful casts her down, and takes all she holds dear. This can be applied to Marjorie, whose presence in King's Landing was really the beginning of Cersei's downfall, or Daenerys, who is the favorite to be the next queen of Westeros. Or some people have even said this to be Sansa. Regardless, our girl Maggie is two for two so far for all the folks keeping score at home. She also says that the king will have 20 children, and that she will have three. Which is true, well, so far, but uh, we'll get to that a little later. Father had other children. Besides me and Tom and Marcella. What are you asking? I'm asking if he fucked other women when he grew tired of you. How many bastards does he have running? So Mystic Mag has been pretty money so far, but there's something from the books that is missing from this scene. First, she says that Cersei's companion, Malara Heatherspoon, cousin of Rhys, will die. Which comes true. But more importantly, the Valen Carr shall wrap his hands around your pale white throat and choke the life from you. Pretty dark, huh? Valen Carr, as we all remember from our 7th grade High Valyrian class, means younger brother. But why leave this out? D&D have been known to make their own changes from George's novel, but this seems different. It's not like they chose not to include the prophecy at all, but rather they did something they said they would never do. They included a flashback. So it seems weird that they're going out of their way to include this, yet leaving out arguably the biggest part of the prophecy. I mean, could they have something else in mind for Cersei and her death that differs from George? I personally believe that Cersei's death will be the same in both book and show, but the path that leads us there might be different due to the butterfly effect caused by the changes already made by D&D. &D. So who is this potential Valonqar? Uh, the first name that comes to mind for many is Tyrion. I mean, to be fair, he's no novice at strangling somebody, and he might need to kill Cersei if he wants to keep the title of best Lannister killer of all time. The relationship between Tyrion and Cersei has always been a rocky one. In the show, Tyrion has tried numerous times to be civil with his sister, but Cersei has never given Tyrion a chance. Even after all the death threats, assassination attempts, in Season 7, Tyrion still tries to protect his family, convincing Danny not to take King's Landing with fire and blood, and meets with Cersei to try and reconcile the past for the greater good. Although he does admit that he's thought of killing her more times than he can count. But could he actually do it, especially after deducing that she is pregnant? And going back to Maggie's prophecy, it says that she will have three children, which have led many fans to believe that Cersei's child will never be born. Could Tyrion actually kill his pregnant sister? Maybe his book counterpart could, who's a little more sinister, but I can't see Tyrion committing such an act. Good thing she has another younger brother. Even though they are twins, Cersei was born before Jaime, thus technically making him a perfect contender for our Valonqar. Last we see Jamie, he is heading north after having a falling out with Cersei, and the reasoning behind his falling out is that Jamie means to fulfill his promise to help the living against the dead in the impending showdown up north. While Cersei, true to form, decides to hire the Golden Company. And Jamie obviously is a character that has been a fan favorite over the years. His arc is one that took the Kingslayer from hated to beloved. Many fans believe this change in his character came after he lost his right hand, which I would agree with to a certain extent. I believe Jamie has always been this morally great character even before his maiming and this change of perspective that drives the belief that he went from evil to good, when in reality he's always been somewhere in the middle. You have him killing Aris to save King's Landing, protecting Brienne, being the only one in his family to accept Tyrion since the day he was born, and then you have things like attacking Ned, throwing Bran out of a window, a seemingly unredeemable act. 
But I don't think it's a stretch to say that Jamie would do the same exact thing in, let's say, season four in order to protect his family. And the reason for this diatribe is to show Jamie's moral flexibility when it comes to doing what he feels is right to justify him being the one to kill Cersei and thus possibly his unborn son. It would be hauntingly poetic for him to commit such an act to someone that he once attempted to kill a young boy to protect. His priorities now are to help fight to save Westeros from destruction, and if anyone, even Cersei threatens that, he will have no choice but to commit such an act. It is a very similar situation that led him to kill the king that he swore to protect, a decision that labeled him as dishonorable and caused him to be looked down upon by his peers. It's a decision that he spent his whole life trying to justify, and it will be now a decision that he has to make again. However, this time, I believe, he will go down as well. Multiple times throughout the novels, it has been said that Jaime and Cersei came into this world together and that they will leave this world together, and it wouldn't surprise me if Jaime would take his own life after first taking Cersei's. The boy won't talk, and if he does, I'll kill him. Him, Ned Stark, the king, the whole bloody lot of them until you and I are the only people left in this world. While I personally believe Jaime will be the one to kill Cersei, there are still other possible suitors that do not belong to the Lannister family. After all, Valonqar means younger brother, that doesn't necessarily mean Cersei's little brother, or it doesn't even have to be a brother at all. For instance, the Hound is technically a younger brother, and he could be directly or indirectly responsible for killing Cersei, seeing as his brother is her sworn bodyguard. But that seems unlikely in the show, but I'm still holding out for a Clegane Bowl. But one possible scenario is one that fans have wanted to see since Cersei first made it onto a certain list. High Valyrian has been mistranslated before. For example, in Feast for Crows, Maester Aemon explains how aspects of the language can be gender neutral when discussing the prophecy of the prince who was promised. Which means Valonqar could easily mean younger sibling. And who is the younger sibling? That's right, Arya. And pretty much every other character, but Arya makes the most sense for this scenario. And I wouldn't put it past D&D &D to make this change as a means for fan service, but some people have pointed out some evidence to suggest that this might happen in the books as well. There's the instance when Tyrion said he used to dream that he'd be rich enough to hire a faceless man to kill his sister. Which, Arya is, kind of. Did she graduate? Pro bono. And also, Valonqar could refer to any queen, not just Cersei. So if Sansa is the younger and more beautiful queen that is set to replace Cersei, then Arya could be the one to carry out the deed allowing Sansa to take the throne. But since it's my belief that there will be no throne for Sansa to take, I don't see this exact scenario taking place, but I've been wrong before. Regardless of who, in fact, is the one that ends up killing Cersei, it'll be interesting to see what the circumstances around it are. Sure, she has had her fair share of enemies, but it doesn't seem like now's the time to worry about exacting your revenge. Especially when all of your would-be suitors are in Winterfell and Cersei is posted up in King's Landing. Something would have to happen that brings all these characters together, and killing Cersei is the only way to prevent the army of the dead from winning. It could be that Jon and Daenerys' forces are driven all the way back to Winterfell to King's Landing, where Cersei closes the gates, leaving them out to die, and Jaime or Tyrion meets with her and makes the only decision that he can. Again, this will be very reminiscent of Jaime's past and what he had to do to take out the Mad King. Forces surrounding King's Landing and Jaime having to kill the ruler in order to open the gates to save the day. Or you can flip Tyrion with Jaime depending on which theory you like. Or going back to before, even Arya could sneak into King's Landing and take out Cersei, and opening the gates let Jon and Daenerys in. Or it could be that Cersei would rather attempt to join the Night King than bow down to Danny or Jon, and they would have to stop her from doing so. What if Cersei, as part of the arrangement, sacrifices her baby to the Night King, creating some type of super Lannister? I don't know, this show is a lot easier to predict when I knew it was coming, because I read the books. Regardless of our Queen's fate in the final season, I think it's safe to say that her demise will be one that is bittersweet for most fans. Even if you can't stand the character, there's no denying that she's one of the best villains the show has ever had to offer, and it'll be a powerful moment when her story comes to an end. Hello everyone, it's Bo Oliver. You should have known I'd squeeze my way into this video. Thank you for tolerating my friend Aaron for the last 15 minutes. Every now and then we let him out of his cage and put him under the bright lights. Now before you leave us for the day, I want to thank our sponsor, NordVPN. For a limited time, you can get 75% off a three-year plan at nordvpn.com slash nerdsoup. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.99 per month, so you can browse the internet safely on all of your devices. Additionally, if you use code nerdsoup, you will receive an extra month of Nord for free. Now, if you find yourself behind a keyboard as often as I do, you'll definitely want to consider using a VPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and that's what it is, a private network that you can connect to that keeps all of your data safe and secure. And with Nord, you're getting the best of the best. 
Nord is the only VPN to receive a perfect score from PC Mag. Nord uses military-grade encryption to secure your data, passwords, IP address, private information. Everything becomes hidden from those who are looking to steal it. Another cool feature of using NordVPN is the ability to access content from all around the world. Let's say you're living overseas and you want to watch a show that's only available in the States. By just a click of the button, you can gain access to that content. Nord has thousands of servers in 61 countries worldwide, so you can be a world-renowned watcher of television and film from all over the globe. Nord also offers a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you're unhappy with absolute safety and security, no big deal. We won't take it personally. But for those who are looking for the peace of mind of internet safety and security, Nord is offering 75% off a three-year plan. Just visit nordvpn.com slash nerdsoup and your subscription will start at just $2.99 per month. And don't forget, use code nerdsoup and you will receive an extra month of Nord for free.